Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Leonard Cohen. The other time I was in quarters such as these was in the Verdun Mental Hospital. <laughs> Montreal. I was visiting. I was visiting a friend. He was on a top floor. And I asked him, for he was still lucid, where can I get a coffee? He said, downstairs. That was one of those famous last words. I commenced the descent of similar stone corridors, and I found myself in a kind of arena, which was surrounded by closed doors. It had been a hot afternoon, and I had removed my jacket, as I am wont to do. I had left it with my friend who, though mentally ill, was no thief. I suspect he wasn't even mentally ill. He was doing this instead of college. I stood watching the four or five doors, wondering about all the possibilities, except the one that occurred door open, and two large men in white uniforms walked out. And they said, where are you supposed to be now? I said, in the cafeteria. They nodded to each other. They said, where are you supposed to be now? In the cafeteria. Well, you see, as their questions continued, my answers, which had started innocent enough, began to sound like I, were, I was protesting too much. In fact, after being interrogated more, three or four more times, I was shouting, pushing them aside, causing them to run after me down the corridor. <laughs> it was only when a guard identified me that I was able to go back to my friend, who had eaten my jacket. <laughs> Out of the crowds of Montreal has come a singular talent with four books under his belt and a growing reputation. He is not primarily a stand-up comic, but a novelist, a poet, and a very confident young man. In my journey, I know I am somewhere beyond the traveling pack of poets. I will remain here until I am sure what I am leaving. During the day I laugh, and during the night I sleep. My favorite cooks prepare my meals, my body cleans and repairs itself, and all my work goes well. Cohen gets around. He lives in Greece, and comes to Canada once or twice a year to renew, as he says, his neurotic affiliations. He picks up a prize or pushes a book, or travels to public appearances with other poets like Irving Leighton. He was not born into this life. He was born into a well-to-do Jewish family dedicated to the clothing business. Only a grandfather was a writer. I knew him in the last uh, year or so of his life. He lived at our house. I, I had the feeling that uh, he was especially happy that I, ha that I had become a writer. We were both writing at the time. He was uh, becoming senile. But in his senility, there were uh, great lapses of poetry. For instance, uh, he'd encounter me in, in the hallway, not recognize me, and then, and then say, oh, you're the writer. You know, as if he'd found some, uh, some guarantee of, uh, of the extension of his own soul. His blood 
On my arm is warm as a bird. His heart in my hand is heavy as lead. His eyes through my eyes shine brighter than love. Oh, send out the raven ahead of the dove. His life in my mouth is less than a man. His death on my breast is harder than stone. His eyes through my eyes shine brighter than love. Oh, send out the raven ahead of the dove. Oh, send out the raven ahead of the dove. Oh, sing from your chains where you're chained in a cave. Your eyes through my eyes shine brighter than love. Your blood in my ballad collapses the grave. Oh, break from your branches a green branch of love after the raven has died for the dove. Monsieur Cohen, 11 heures. Temps de vous lever. Merci. When in Montreal, Cohen holds up in a $3 a night hotel room on the Tenderloin. Well, you always have a feeling in a hotel room that you're on the lam. And it's one of the safe moments in the escape. It's that breathing spot. The hotel room is the oasis of the, of the downtown. It's a kind of temple of refuge. It's sanctuary. Sanctuary of a temporary kind, therefore, all the more delicious. But whenever I come into a hotel room, and there's a moment after the door is shut and the lights you haven't turned on illumine a very comfortable, anonymous, subtly hostile environment. And you know that uh, you found the little place in the grass and the hounds are going to go by for three more hours. You're going to have a drink, light a cigarette and take a long time shaving. Like that, do you? <laughs> there. Now, don't you look beautiful? I look better than when I started. Mm -hmm. Can you do something about my body? A lady journalist in Winnipeg once described him as having the stoop of an aged crop picker and the face of a curious little boy. His talent has been saluted by the international press. Canadian critics have called him the finest poet of his generation. He himself says he has chosen a path that is infinitely wide and without direction. This, he says, is a very good path for someone who moves in the funny way that he does. All right, we've got your concern. Your concern is Irving Layton and his survival, even more than the survival of the mass of the And Cohen's concern is my renunciation of the Canadian public. Is this true, or have you some <laughs> other concern, Mr. Cohen, that you'd like to get off your chest right now? I, uh... I, I haven't a single concern. Well, come on now. What do you care about, really? Don't you care about anything? Uh, how can you be a, a good poet and not care about something? No, no. I, I do the poetry. You do the commentary. No, but uh, I'm. let's get this straight. Are you saying that, you have, that there's nothing that worries you, nothing that bothers you? How can you write poetry if you're not bothered by something? Are you well, a, I, a I, 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 I'm bothered um, when I get up in the morning. My real concern is to discover whether or not I'm in a state of grace. And if I make that investigation, and I discover that if, I, if I'm not in a state of grace, I try to go to bed. What do you mean by a state of grace? It's a phrase a, that I've never understood. That's a kind, a state of grace is that kind of balance with which you ride the chaos that you find around you. It's not a matter of resolving the chaos because there's something arrogant and warlike about putting the world in order but having that kind of, uh, like an escaped ski down over a hill, just going through the contours of the Oh, chaos. you have lost me. What Cohn is trying to do right now is to preserve the self. That's his real concern. I think that is the concern for every poet, to preserve the self in a world that is rapidly steams, or steamrollering the selves out of existence and establishing a uniform world. How do you make out with Bert, Pierre Burton? Well, uh, he really wanted me to cut my con out. You know, he really, he really implied that, uh, okay, Leonard Cohen, we know, we know the party line. You know, we know what you've got to say. Now really tell us the business of, of, about poetry. What's the true story, you know? Is wrestling really fixed? Leonard Cohen, 
Spice box of Earth, take one. Okay, Leonard, we start on the spice box, and any place you come across a dirty word, we have to delete it. Yeah, well, there are no dirty words, ever. Leonard, just try to remember this is a performance. The University of Toronto has bought his manuscripts. His work is put on phonograph records. I'm to do something with them. I know they're kind of flat. Spice box of Earth, a kite is a victim, page one. A kite is a victim you are sure of. You love it because it pulls gentle enough to call you a master, strong enough to call you fool. Because it lives like a desperate trained falcon in the high sweet air, and you can always haul it down to tame it in your drawer. A kite is a contract of glory that must be made with the sun. So you make friends with the field, the river, and the wind. Then you pray the whole cold night before under the traveling cordless moon to make you worthy and lyric and pure. Cut. <laughs> Leonard Cohen wants to be heard. He's been known to leave his mark on the wall of a favorite hangout. The bistro is like an irresponsible sanctuary. You aren't sure whether the hounds are waiting inside or whether you've just left them. Double cognac. There's a very p particular glow that a, that a hostile crowd emits. No, the crowd that is interested in consuming you in it. But sometimes, on the other hand, it's, it's composed of some sort of fixative that is sprayed on you as soon as you walk in, and you become very, very much yourself, and everybody is very much himself. Well, hey, Graham, you suffer as much as I do. I'd like to see that. I'm no longer well, around. I'm, I'm no longer... He said to me one night, you don't want that man in here molesting you. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. So he cuts me off. Don't come in here. I'll uh, hit you over the head with a buck. Last time he called the cop. Yeah. Yeah, but you're not so a respectable it? customer. I the hell I'm not. You're quiet and drunk. He's one of the most respectable customers I've ever met. No, he doesn't have a nice white shirt and a business suit. He does. Who the hell does? How many shirts are in here now? Yeah, but this is the resort. No, it's the bistro. I love bistro. Cohen has been in films since 1937. Here is a movie filled with the bodies of his family. His father aims the camera at his uncles, tall and serious boutonnieres in their dark lapels, who walk too close and enter into blurdom. Now the boy and his cousins fight small, gentlemanly battles. The girls curtsy. All the children are invited to leap, one at a time, across the flagstone path. A battalion of wives is squeezed abreast, is decimated by the edge of the screen. His mother is one of the first to go. Much of his early life and much of his writing centers on the Montreal Park where he played as a child. The park nourished all the sleepers in the surrounding houses. It was the green heart. It gave the children dangerous bushes and heroic landscapes so they could imagine bravery. It gave the nurses and maids winding walks so they could imagine beauty. It gave Cohen a place to meet girls, so he could imagine love. He wanted to know everything about her. Was she allowed to listen to the shadow? Could she get gangbusters? Had she ever been called a dirty Jew? They fell silent, and the nurses and their blonde babies reasserted their control of the universe. They squeezed hands, kissed once when the light was low enough, coming golden through the prickly bushes. And they walk slowly home, not holding hands, but bumping against each other. Breveman sat at the table, trying to understand why he wasn't hungry. His mother extolled the lamb chops. His mother still lives in the house of his childhood, and he pays her periodic visits. It has been claimed that he lives off his family. 
he has an inheritance of $750 a year. I am sorry that the rich man must go and his house become a hospital. I loved his wine, his contemptuous servants, his 10-year-old ceremonies. I loved his car, which he wore like a snail shell everywhere. And I loved his wife, the hours she put into her skin, the milk, the lust, the industries that served her complexion. I loved his son, who looked British, but had American ambitions, and let the word aristocrat comfort him like a reprieve while Kennedy reigned. I love the rich man. I hate to see his season ticket for the opera fall into a pool for opera lovers. Just beyond the green rose the large stone houses of Westmount Avenue. In them, the baseball players were growing their bodies with sleep, resting their voices. He imagined that he could see them dimly through the walls of the upper stories, or rather the sheets they were wrapped in, floating row upon row over the street, like a colony of cocoons in a moonlit tree. The young men of his age, Christian and blonde, dreaming of Jewish sex and bank careers. Cohen has broken with family tradition, but not with individual relatives. It may be a chance meeting with a wealthy cousin now living in Rio and in town for a visit, or lunch at the Ritz with an uncle. His wanderings are punctuated by chance encounters. He is generous with his friendship and with any money he happens to have. At the moment, he is very well healed. One of his books of poetry was a runaway bestseller. His only novel had an advanced paperback printing of 120,000 copies. 1964 was a very good year. With prizes and other fringe benefits, he earned $17,000. Before that, he earned next to nothing, and a return to poverty will have no noticeable effect on his way of life. Madame, est-ce qu'on peut commander quelque chose? Oui, monsieur, avec plaisir. Je voudrais un sandwich au fromage, puis un verre de lait, s'il vous plaît. Un verre de lait? Oui. Après lui, monsieur Bowen. Merci. Cohen finds nourishment both in the crowds and in solitude. He finds it too in an ancient Chinese book of oracles called the I Ching. Do you really feel like staking your participation in the future on advice from the I Ching at this moment? Well, I'm willing to take guidance from the book. All right. You want this? Okay. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> you never know. Well, we might have to do nine. The I Ching dates back to Confucius, but was discovered by the Western world barely 50 years ago. Although it bears a superficial resemblance to a Ouija board, the great psychiatrist Carl Jung extolled the I Ching as a valuable tool to self-examination and to achieving insight into one's true personality. Approach means supreme success. Perseverance furthers. When the eighth month comes, there will be misfortune. Oh, what month is this? <laughs> <laughs> it's the eleventh month, so we're okay. <laughs> the hexagram as a whole points to a time of joyous, hopeful progress. Spring is approaching. Joy and forbearance bring high and low near together. Joy and forbearance. Success is certain, but we must work with determination and perseverance to make full use of the propitiousness of the time. And one thing more, spring does not last forever. <laughs> <laughs> In Greece, Cohen loves and lives with a girl named Mariana. Beneath my hands, your small breasts are the upturned bellies of breathing fallen sparrows. Wherever you move, I hear the sounds of closing wings, of falling wings. I am speechless because you have fallen beside me, because your eyelashes are the spines of tiny, fragile animals. 
I dread the time when your mouth begins to call me Hunter. Mariana waits for Cohen in a white house on the Greek island of Hydra. He moved to Greece in 1961 after a miserable winter in England. One day I was walking down Bank Street. I'd had a, a tooth out and it was raining and I had a cold. And I saw the Bank of Greece etched in, mar etched in marble. And I went in there and, and there was a, a man wearing sunglasses behind the counter. I thought that was, <laughs> that was really splendid. That was, a real, that was the most eloquent protest against the entire landscape that I'd seen, you know? He was wearing sunglasses in the bank and then only had moderate fluorescent lighting. In Greece, he has picked up a strong working knowledge of the language. He is fascinated by the violence of the Mediterranean, but has developed a pronounced distaste for meat. This shows in his writings. Great torsos of meadow animals strung in glistening, flayed exhibitions. Heads piled in pyramids like park cannonballs, some of them cruelly facing a sausage display of their missing extremities. Right. And further down the corridor, no recognizable animal shapes, but chunks of their bodies, shaped not by hide or muscle, but by cleaver, knife, and appetite. I think humanity, I, well, it's true that since I stopped eating meat, I feel a lot better among animals. I feel I can be much more honest when I pat a dog. Cohen collects his letters and makes certain he is heavily photographed. He does this simply because he feels he's becoming an important writer and that such material will someday be of value. And yet, he is totally devoid of arrogance and is deeply concerned with the style of his soul. Hold me, hard light, soft light, hold me. Moonlight in your mountains, fold me. Sunlight in your tall waves, scald me. Iron light in your wires, shield me. Death light in your darkness, wield me. In burlap bags, the bankers sew me. In countries far, the merchants sell me. In icy caves, the princes throw me. In golden rooms, the doctors geld me. In battlefields, the hunters rule me. I will starve till prophets find me. I will bleed till angels bind me. Still I sing till churches blind me, still I love, till cogwheels wind me. Well, hold me, hard light, soft light, hold me, moonlight in your mountains, hold me, sunlight in your tall waves, scold me, I light in your wires, shield me, death light. Cohen's circle of real friends is small. One who stayed in the clothing business and makes a great deal of money is Robert Hirshhorn. Hirshhorn is one of the great tightrope acrobats of our century. He flirts with cliches, he dances with prototypes, but he, he escapes them all. He just dances between them. Another is a sculptor, Mort Rosengarten. Mort is one of the great gentlemen that anybody who knows him knows. Uh, he's organically a gentleman. He's one of my oldest and dearest friends. And we only have four or five friends, and lucky if you have that many. Then there's the painter, Derek May. He is the most irreverent person that I know, and uh, his humor is based on the idea of upset. That's what he does with ideas. He rocks them like those toys, those boxing toys that never fall over. Keeping the 
the party going? <laughs> We're keeping the party going. <laughs> this is this is no. Listen seriously. I think most of the women that my friends love are very attractive, sexual people. That is something which, happily, and for which we must bend our knees all the time, sexuality is general. And although only one man may be receiving the favors of a woman, all men in her presence are warm. That's the great generosity of women and the great generosity of the Creator who worked it out that way. Is that there are no unilateral agreements of sexuality. And the world starts moving like clockwork. Clock, clockwork. <laughs> 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 As the mist leaves no scar on the dark green hill, so my body leaves no scar on you, nor ever will. When wind and hawk encounter, what remains to keep? So you and I encounter, then turn, then fall to sleep. Because what he sets up really are certain, and, and they're beautiful standards, but they're very definite standards of English humor. Well, I was going to say if William Wordsworth had stepped on immediately after, or Swinburne, it would have gone in beautifully, you know. Well, no, this was uh, this is a and he was behind me all the time in the reading, and I know that you know he's with us. Cohen's interest in young people is genuine. He has a rapport with youth. He feels that he is a voice of this generation, and he listens to what it has to say. What a music! What? Well, it's just the man didn't flub one single syllable, or blur, or slur a single word. Cohen once wrote of academic gatherings as providing the poet with little more than opportunity for sexual conquest. But now he says he is anxious to preserve all of the species. He now moves easily in these surroundings. Still, he despises literary pretense and insists that poetry is not an occupation, but a verdict. He spent three years at McGill University as an average art student and one inglorious semester in law. He entered eagerly into the affairs of the student establishment. His career as a big man on the campus was typically unorthodox. He won election as president of the debating union and then refused to call debates. He hated the concept of fraternities, but won election as president of a fraternity and then fought to retain its exclusive Jewish character. I don't like the way the evidence is building up. <laughs> I've got the Westmount. I've got Westmount. Uh, I've got, I've got the chauffeur. Yeah. And I've got the fraternity. I've got, I've got the the politics. Yeah. Well, you've got rid of the debating union. Uh, you know, all Didn't I have to. Didn't you almost get rid of the fraternity too? All I have to tell you, all I have to tell you now is that I was good in sports, <laughs> <laughs> and I've completely ruined the cliche of the poet forever. <laughs> but that wasn't true. Really, he played hockey. <laughs> uh, I played a little hockey in 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 public school. <laughs> Up to the age of twelve, I was uh, about about the ninth best defenseman in the class. <laughs> He is a constant wanderer. Little black notebooks are stuffed with pertinent observations. These he mixes with his considerable talent to produce his art. For you, I will be a ghetto Jew and dance and put white stockings on my twisted limbs and poison wells across the town. 
For you I will be a banker Jew and bring to ruin a proud old hunting king and end his line. For you I will be a Broadway Jew and cry in theaters for my mother and sell bargain goods beneath the counter. For you I will be a Dachau Jew and lie down in lime with twisted limbs and bloated pain no mind can understand. Cohen is not self-consciously cultured. He has not read extensively. He listens largely to pop music. He has, however, a hypersensitivity and an enormous curiosity. I'm very concerned. I, I was looking at the back. I was looking at the back of True Story this afternoon. <laughs> and I saw, I saw about, um, about 20 ads about unwanted hair. <laughs> this, the hair was, uh, a lot of people were offering to get rid of hair. <laughs> they were offering to sandpaper it away, <laughs> shave it away, pull it out, <laughs> cut it, dissolve it with cream, Electrocute it. <laughs> I mean, you're very concerned with unwanted babies, but nobody cares for unwanted hair. <laughs> I think there should be a place for unwanted hair <laughs> in this society. I think, at the very least, there should be a hair museum. I mean, there should be somewhere a hair asylum. <laughs> there should be somewhere where um, middle-aged ladies' mustaches can reside. <laughs> uh, college beards abandoned for careers. I mean, a man, a man should be able to go into one of these hair asylums and, you know, review his whole life. <laughs> Montreal is still small enough to have one or two centers, one or two late night centers. And into this funnel is drawn everyone who happens to be up that night, or at least a, a representation of the various groups operating in the night. And groups operating the night always have a special kind of interest and a special kind of ritualistic uh, atmosphere. And women? Not Greek women. No? Why not? Because uh, Greek, Greek, Greek brothers feel very covetous about mm -hmm. their sisters. Mm -hmm. Shock and weddings. Not shock and wedding, knife murders. Knife murders, great, great. That's, that's <laughs> And into these places, these special places in the city, and Ben's is one of them, uh, is drawn this very urgent cross-section of people who have somehow committed the first rebellious act that a man can perform, refusing to sleep. That's the real rebellion against life and the generative process. That's the real human idea. I refuse to sleep. I'm going to, um, I'm going to protest the idea of sleep by turning night into day. I'm going to revel and drink and womanize all night. In this way, I show time, death, the natural process of destruction, decay, and regeneration. I show it all that, with my mind and my will, I, man, triumph. So they come to Ben's. Maybe you're reading the wrong books. <laughs> yeah, I think you're Stop right. Stop reading poetry. Maybe you should read poetry. I don't read poetry, huh? Oh, you only write it. I don't, I hardly write it even. With the popular sounds of the day ringing in his ear, Cohen works his talent very hard. He writes and rewrites for about five hours a day. He writes of himself. I am with the hunters, hungry and shrewd, and I am with the hunted, quick.
quick and soft and nude. He writes of the night. From a hill I watched the apple blossoms breathe the silver out of the night, like fish eating the spheres of air out of the river. He writes of the drug addict and his needle. Under hard lights, with doctor's instruments, you were at work in the bathrooms of the city, changing the law. The spike hunts constant as a compass. He writes of a Greek harbor. The stony path coiled around me and bound me to the night. A boat hunted the edge of the sea under a hissing light. Something soft involved the net and bled around a spear. In 1961, he anticipated the Bay of Pigs invasion and went to Cuba. The real reason was a, a deep interest in violence. I was very interested in, in what it really meant for men to carry arms and to kill other men and how attracted I was exactly to that process. Uh, that, that's getting closer to the truth. The, the real truth is that I wanted to kill or be killed. Uh, no, no, I don't want to give the idea, as I've been giving in the past 10 or 15 minutes, that I'm completely obsessed with the idea of danger. But I suppose I am. So it's just as well that I gave the idea away. I was in Havana in 1961 during the Bay of Pigs invasion, fighting on both sides. <laughs> and I wrote this poem called The Only Tourist in Havana Turns His Thoughts Homeward. <laughs> Come, my brothers, let us govern Canada. Let us find our serious heads. Let us dump asbestos on the White House. Let us make the French talk English, not only here, but everywhere. <laughs> Let us torture the Senate individually <laughs> until they confess. Let us purge the new party. Let us encourage the dark races so they'll be lenient when they take over. <laughs> Let us make the CBC talk English. Let us all lean in one direction and float down to the coast of Florida. <laughs> Let us have two governor generals at the same time. Let us have another official language. Let us determine what it will be. Let us give a Canada Council fellowship to the most original suggestion. Let us teach sex in the home to parents. Let us threaten to join the USA and pull out at the last moment. <laughs> My brothers, come. Our serious heads are waiting for us somewhere, like Gladstone bags abandoned after a coup d'etat. Let us put them on very quickly. Let us maintain a stony silence on the St. Lawrence Seaway. I would like to remind the management that the drinks are watered and the hat check girl has syphilis and the band is composed of former SS monsters. However, since it is New Year's Eve and I have lip cancer, I will place my paper hat on my concussion and dance. <laughs> At the completion of the shooting of this film, 
Cohen was invited to a screening room to take a look at himself. It's a very uh, privileged thing to be able to see yourself sleeping. I think it's uh, an experience very few people have. That's right. But of course, uh, the fraud is that I'm not really sleeping. Very privileged thing to see yourself pretending to sleep. Yes, I think that's, that's even more, that's a privilege of a higher and more esoteric order. Because there are some people who are very, very interested to know how they look when they're pretending. I was always good with my hands. <laughs> This is a situation which, for whatever the reason, a man has allowed a number of strangers into his bathroom. Now, it's true we're making a film about my life, and the film purports to examine my life closely, and the bath is part of my life. But still, regardless of the reason, here, 1964, a man has invited a group of strangers to observe him cleaning his body. You must find this interesting. I find it very interesting. I find it... I find it sinister. And, of course, I find it flattering. Because there's a point where... where every man shares the Aga Khan's delight at selling his bath water. What did we mean to by the that? Faithful. What did you mean by that inscription? Caveat, a message to the audience? Yes, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. I think, I think that uh, I had to, for a moment, act as a double agent for both the filmmakers and the public. I, I, had, I had to warn the public that... It's like that little beep that goes through certain recorded phone messages that you hear on the radio. I thought I would make this little beep and let... let let the man watching me know that there, this is not entirely devoid of the con. <laughs> C-O-N. <laughs> right. I look much more like a man than I thought. In fact, I think I've had a very, very, a very, very mistaken conception about what style of man I was. I think the whole thing is changing now. You mean just looking at this movie? Yeah. I think I'm, a, I'm of a different style than I thought I was. It may affect your whole life. Well, I hope it affects my whole life. And so it is time to go. Back to Greece and the girl and the son. And always back to the work. For as Leonard Cohen says, there are dreams of glory whispering through the wires of his spine.